Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this, our Sunday morning worship for the 19th of February. If you are struggling to hear me for any reason, just give me a little sign, a little signal, and I will try to speak into the microphone or try to speak louder. As we get ready to worship this morning, I invite you to join me in prayer. Let us pray. Holy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord, of all our praise and attention. As we gather in this place, or even virtually in our homes, we welcome your holy presence among us. Help us to turn our focus on you now, so we can praise you from deep within our hearts and souls. Open our minds to receive your word and to hear what you have to say specifically to each one of us today. Be with those who are participating in your service, particularly our IT team as we navigate new technology, and also with Reverend Donvan as he brings to us your word. Thank you for the opportunity to serve and worship you in freedom and comfort. Amen. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 145, and I'll invite you to um, join with me as we read together from the overhead. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. Thank you. Amen. We'll sit and sing our gathering song, um, Holy, Holy is the Lord.
Amen. I warmly welcome all of you again to our Sunday morning worship. If you are here with us visiting for the first time, we say a special welcome to you, and we hope that our worship time will be um, uplifting to you and we'd see you again. If you're joining for the first time virtually, we also say welcome to you and hope that you'd uh, tune in again to join us. Apologies, we started a few minutes late because I was busy um, chatting to Reverend Donovan in the vestry and we weren't paying attention to the time. I will try to go through our announcements as quickly as I can. They should be up on the overheads as well, so if you want to make notes. Um, if you are interested in becoming a member of the church, there are going to be some orientation sessions listed on the dates above, 1st, 8th, and 25th of March. The first two sessions would be online and the last one in person. To get more information, you can email uh, Reverend Donovan, and his email is on, listed on that um, list, email that Sheila sends out, and it's also listed in our weekly news, which you should be getting a copy of. If you're not getting a copy of this, um, speak to Sheila and she can add you to the email list. Um, speaking of weekly news, there's also, um, we've just started the monthly news, which tells us about what's going on in the life of our church. Um, this is sent electronically, but there are a few physical copies at the back, so if you'd like one or you'd like to share a copy with someone, you can grab one from the back. Uh, it's a monthly issue, so the next one would be out sometime in March. Also, if anybody would like to um, submit an article or an announcement, you can email myself or <laughs> Sheila. Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday, and there's going to be a fellowship service for all United Churches at the Prospect Youth Center. Um, also, to take note, if anyone is interested in baptism on that day, um, that is also available. And if you would like to be baptized on that Ash Wednesday, you can reach out to Reverend Donovan. Again, his contact details are on the, um, the weekly news. Um, Synod delegates, we're having, um, Cayman is hosting uh, Synod meetings in Cayman on the 22nd to the 1st of May, and we are actively looking for various contributions uh, for the delegates, accommodation, transportation, and other uh, financial support. So if you are interested or you would like to get more information, you can reach out to Tessa. So please take note of those dates. Bible studies on a short break. We will resume on the 8th of March, so the um, details will be sent out closer to that time, so uh, look out for that on the weekly, weekly news. Um, sorry, before I go to birthdays, Juliet, um, I just wanted to highlight on the prayer list. Um, we have a few people to add on our prayer list. We've been praying for Jim and Carla Smith. They are Caymanian missionaries. Um, Carla is now in Malaysia undergoing cancer treatment, so we want to keep her in prayer. We're also remembering um, lay Pastor John McMillan and his family. I was in communication with Miss Janet this week, and she mentioned that he's finally been moved to a rehab facility, and they're hoping that he should be at home soon. Uh, we're still praying for Miss Olive Bush, um, who is 92 years old, and um, still a part of our congregation, although she's not here. She lives down the road and is very part of our South Sound 96. Oh, sorry, 96. <laughs> um, 96 years old, still a part of our um, South Sound community and South Sound Church. She's not doing well, so we want to keep her in prayer. And also, um, again, our church neighbors and um, fellow congregants, George and Susan. Last week, we mentioned that George was in hospital. He's at home now recovering, but we still want to keep both of them uh, in prayer. Birthdays, I only have one listed here. Anyone else last week or in the coming week? But I see our birthday boy is here. So we're going to sing happy birthday for you, and we have no anniversaries on record. Any anniversaries to mention? No? No? All right, Jonas, we're going to sing happy birthday for you.
hope I don't bore you with these details, but I love history. And sometimes when I'm looking up hymns to sing on a Sunday morning, I like to look up who wrote it and why they wrote it. And this particular hymn is one of my favorites. It might surprise you because it's an older hymn, but I love, love, love the lyrics, and I thought it was appropriate as we're um, observing communion. This hymn was actually written in Swedish, and a British missionary uh, minister heard it being sung in Russian, and then he translated it into English. So, I'll invite you to stand with me as we sing our songs of praise, O oh Lord my God.
Our next song is In Him We Live and Move. Have your seats. One thing I wanted to mention for those joining us at home, we are observing communion today, so if you'd like to get your elements prepared for later on in the service, just make note of that. As we continue in worship, I invite you to join me in prayer again. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you know each one of us. The Bible says you know every hair on our head. How amazing is that? You know us by name. You even know the deep thoughts we have in our hearts. Almighty God, we adore you for the work of your hands. You have spread so much beauty over the earth for us to enjoy. Even though the world may seem dark and fallen at times, the universe shines with your glory, greatness, and majesty. When we take the time to really look, we can see your beauty in the earth, sea, and sky. The richness of the blue sea, the songs of the birds, and the loveliness of flowers. We give thanks for all the seasons of life you have given to us, particularly those moments we cherish and hold dear to our hearts. We reflect on the past week and acknowledge your blessings. All those small moments we take for granted, and even those challenging times, Lord, when we know you are there supporting us, we say thank you. As we come together to remember your great sacrifice, we thank you that we can experience your incredible grace. When we partake in communion later in this service, Help us to remember the great price you paid for our sins. Have mercy on us as we silently confess our, fin our sins to you now. Draw us together to embrace and to forgive one another. We confess our great need for you. We are mere human and need your help to live the life you have called us to live. And we need your help to forgive others. Bring peace and restoration in our hearts so that when we leave this place, we can carry your gospel of love and peace to the world. And now we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thine will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and glory forever and ever, amen. Hear these words of assurance, which comes from Isaiah amazingly written hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, 
and by his wounds we are healed. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from Matthew, Matthew 17, 1 to 9. Good morning. Matthew chapter 17, reading from verses 1 to verse 9. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. <clears throat> While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Do not be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. to hear um, the word of God. We'll sit and sing, seek ye first, and the children may leave for Sunday school. Bless your word to our hearts, and glorify your name. Amen. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. Um, it is a Sunday when we celebrate how, by our scripture reading, Jesus and his disciples go up into a mountain and have this wonderful experience. But I want you to notice that there is a story that comes after that telling of them going into the mountain. 
that comes after our reading about the Transfiguration, it is a story about demonic oppression. After the disciples are caught up in the heavenly realm, in their mountaintop experience, in this wonderful place where they even think, let's stay here because this is really so good, they come down to earth and then they find a guy who needs healing from a life debilitating condition. When they come from the place of excitement, of connection, of worship, of, of beauty, they come to where life happens. The verses I want for you to read along with me come from verses 14 through 20. It says, when, the crowd, when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him, Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't, it, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I think that Matthew tells this story, especially after the transfiguration story, to show a couple of things. At a primary level, he wants us to know that Jesus' desire for wholeness in people's lives goes beyond the moments of excitement and the moments when everybody is all happy and together. That Jesus is always moved by people's needs. He is always aware of the fact that he lives in a world where people are in need of some kind of, of touch, of some kind of healing, of some kind of um, intervention in the struggles of their lives. So, the, even the ethereal and the otherworldly things don't distract Jesus from people's felt needs. He is very much aware of and concerned about our bread and butter issues. He is concerned about how we live and how, what impacts each of our lives. So that there is a sense in which human brokenness exists in the midst of real life whether you are caught up in worship or in the normal cut and thrust of regular everyday life. And this story is there to say that Jesus is able to hold those two things together. There is an automatic connection between what is considered the spiritual, what happens in this place when we come aside from the world for an hour and sing the songs of Zion and listen to the scriptures and are encouraged by our company together, there's a connection between that spiritual and the ordinary that happens when we step outside. And you would want to think that one should equip you for the other. And that's part of why we come to church every week. Um, we come not just because it's a wonderful routine, but because somewhere in this experience, hopefully we are encouraged and built up and, and strengthened so we can go out into the regular, into the ordinary, into even the places that are difficult. So I think the story is put there for that reason. But I also think that it is put there to give attention to the fact that when confronted by human brokenness, by the needs that people have, there is often a struggle between what you can explain and what escapes human language. So this story presents that possibility for us. The language that is used in this text, if you notice on the part of the guy who is speaking about his son who is not well, is the language of illness, of seizures. But when Jesus speaks, he speaks in the language of demon possession. Matthew 
is corroborated and confirmed by the other Synoptic writers like Mark and, and, um, and Luke in, in both of those books in chapter 9, where they also tell a story where the youngster is described as being overpowered and taken near to fire and water, just like Matthew says it, all places of danger. And they describe it as if he is being torn and thrown and dashed. And they say that he has been tortured and convulsed. He's foaming at the mouth and he's grinding his teeth. What the boy's father does in the story is to offer a description to Jesus of symptoms, of things that he is seeing expressed in the behavior of the, the boy. But what Jesus does is that he reframes it for the guy, for the father. And he makes it, though it is very much something that manifests in the ways that he describes, Jesus reframes it as a matter that he sees what is happening to the young man as an attempt by some force outside of good, outside of God, that is attempting to control and subjugate and oppress and inflict harm. And wherever those things come from, it seems as if he is making the point, Jesus, in this story, that we understand it, that that is not how God really intends for God's world to be or for God's people to exist. And so he frames this as a way of saying that sometimes we experience things that we don't even have the language for. So in the story, if we move away from it to our own life experiences, sometimes you have language to tell your friends, this is what's happening to me. But sometimes you don't even have the language to express it. Um, I don't know if you ever heard mothers who are really concerned about their children. Um, and perhaps children have kind of de um, detoured and gone on to paths that they're, they're not happy about how they've gone. And, and they talk about it. And then somewhere in that telling of that story, they kind of groan or make a, a grunt. Like, mm. Sometimes the things that people experience escape human language. Sometimes it is not just what we say, but it's sometimes what we don't say, what we can't say, what we can't express. And sometimes we need other people around us to help us to articulate even some of the things that we're experiencing. Anybody been there? That in those spaces of struggle, and this story helps us to understand that, that Jesus enters into the place of this guy's real concern, a father's genuine concern for his son, who has a situation, a condition that he seems not to be able to get over, and he really needs something to be done for it. People generally consider the manifestations of uh, what is happening in this young man's life, something that is simply physiological or, or, or a mental disorder, but Jesus frames it as a brokenness that comes from a force that is seeking to debilitate. And we live in a world where there is a constant battle between the good God who has made it and the evil one who is attempting to subjugate, to oppress, to create mayhem and disorder. Jesus puts it in words like this. The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. You remember that passage in, in, in John's gospel? But I am come that you might have life and have it in its fullness. It is that way in which Jesus is framing this conversation, this experience as he intervenes in the young man's life. This way of understanding the situation is very important to us because it for us to recognize that there are some times and there are some things over which we become powerless. Sometimes we feel impotent in our human selves to overcome. I know we live in a, a world uh, that values um, self and independence and, and the ability to, to do, to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and to get it done. We live in a world that is like that, but sometimes life hits you with things that no matter how well-resourced you are, no matter how strong a person you are, no matter how wonderful other things and, 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 and how organized other things in your life might be, sometimes you come to a place where there is just nothing you can do. And maybe you come to a place and you're like, uh, a puddle, you know, 
melt away. And Lord, have mercy on me. So the young boy was powerless over his condition. The father was helpless to act on behalf of his child. And that's a, an awful place for a parent to be and to feel. that They can't do anything for their child. And then the story also helps us to see that the disciples are also unable, unable to carry out Jesus' bidding, which Jesus had just given to them in chapter 10, when Jesus said to them, heal those who are sick, bring back to dead those who, uh, bring back to life those who have died, make those who have skin diseases clean again, drive out demons, for you have received freely. So give freely. Wow. And here is this one. Fellow's not dead. Well, some other things might be there, but, 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 but this should be relatively easy, shouldn't it, Lord? Based on what you've asked us to, to do, and we're not able to do it. Sometimes you get to the place in life where you're stopped in your tracks and you recognize that your human ability is not enough, not able to respond to that. And when we come to that place of powerlessness, the effects of it can be that it affects the life and the testimony uh, of the person, of, of the believer, of the person who, who, who is speaking the name of Christ. And sometimes we live in that place of powerlessness and life becomes almost mediocre and ineffective and, our, and sometimes our, our, our testimony can become embarrassing. Or anything about in terms of the church, sometimes ministries go unmanned or undermanned, needs go overlooked, Programs go unfunded, and workers become overtaxed because there is a powerlessness to carry out what Jesus has asked to be done. And it causes the world to question, to question the validity of our faith and to question the God that we declare and proclaim, the God who we say has power, has the ability to do abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. So what does it require? So, like in all these stories, there's something that's set up, and then Jesus gives a response. Because the guys in the story are confronted by their powerlessness, their impotence. And so they say to Jesus, why is it that we couldn't drive out this demon? After Jesus simply says to the guy, get better. And the guy gets better. Jesus speaks the word, and, um, and, and it happens. Why couldn't we do that? They turn to Jesus. And Jesus responds, because you have so little faith. I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be moved. Nothing will be impossible for you. So the problem is a problem of faith. I know we have heard people express it in ways to say that sometimes things don't happen in our lives because you don't have the faith, and it could happen if you had the faith. And sometimes a way of shaming us into thinking that, um, you know, maybe is there something wrong with us why, why, why God hasn't worked. I don't think this text is about that, per se, because what it does is that it makes a point about the size of the faith in this text. So, this is not a text that is telling us that you need to have bigger faith. Okay, so why didn't it work for you? Oh, because your faith wasn't big enough. You need to do this to express the faith. And, and of course, you find places where people tell you the way that you express their faith in bigger ways is to give bigger money. I'm sure you've heard that. Or, to, or make dramatic kinds of, of displays because that's the way to demonstrate it. Jesus is very clear in what he says here about the kind of faith. He says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, small, tiny seed. So if faith like a mustard seed can cause mountains to be removed, so what does it say about the fact that nothing happens when the disciples are unable to do anything? It's perhaps because they have not even a mustard seed for the mouth of faith. Perhaps because where their trust is, what it is that they have been putting their trust in, is misplaced. Because sometimes we can have faith, but we have faith in the wrong things. We, we, we can sometimes have faith in our own abilities, faith in the institution of church, faith in, 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 in other structures and so on. And the invitation Jesus says, it's because you have 
no faith. So Jesus makes a connection between the healing and salvation that is needed in this passage, the, 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 the wholeness that is required here. He makes a connection between that and faith. Healing and salvation are linked to trusting Christ because we trust Christ as both our healer and our savior. And the, so the problem of believing was not only that of the boy and the fathers, but is also of the, the disciples. And they were unable to accomplish what God was wanting to do. And God is desirous of doing in our world simply because they were misplacing their trust. Sometimes, you know, we are victims of our own, um, you know, accomplishments. We're victims of our own times. We're victims of our own um, ways of, of thinking and, the, and the, the, the progress and the, and the um, looking for a word here, you know, what is modern and all of that. We're victims of those things because we have been told this is how it is done when Jesus is simply saying some, there are some things. And, and another translation of this text is um, there are some things that come by prayer and fasting. I think it's like one of the King, the King James Version, I think, might translate it in that way. Because it suggests that there are some things that come only in the dependence on God. One um, Christian writer puts it this way, beware of worshiping Jesus as a son of God and professing your faith in him as the savior of the world while you blaspheme him by the complete evidence in your daily life that he is powerless to do anything in and through you. So beware of calling the name of Jesus, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, of real trust, of even little faith, like mustard seed. So I think this text invites us to do things as we apply and, and, and close our conversation. I think it invites us to plug into a connection with God. Um, oftentimes our lives have little or no connectivity to God because apart from the mountaintop experiences where we, where we plug and then unplug. Anybody is like that? You kind of like, let's go to church, Let's have our devotions. Let's do those things that plug. But then, let's put it down so that we can deal with real life. <laughs> Sometimes our lives have an, a disconnection. So we're invited to connect. Have a connection that, 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 that transcends a particular moment that goes without us into that space. It's like a, a person who has a conflict with another person. Um, lovely coming out of a lovely worship experience where their hands are raised to the Lord. Well, you don't raise hands, but your hearts are raised to the Lord. So, um, you know, in that experience of, of, of worship, and they come outside and somebody comes to and they say, hey, I might be Christian in there, but this is really where you're going to... This, And if, you, if, if you're from my, my, my upbringing, you would hear expressions like, my mouth or my hands don't join church. Meaning, I might be a member of the church, but if I need to use these, they are not members. If I need to use that, that's not a member. We don't join church. It is that sense in which it invites us into a connection. And sometimes our lives have little or no connectivity. Operating in the ordinary without the benefit of, of the divine working in and through us in the different spaces of our lives. And that's why, they, as I said, the translation puts it, some things only come by fasting and prayer. It is by that decision to be connected to God in ongoing ways. So you've heard about the guy who bought a computer, right? Lovely computer, went home, studied the manual, connected the wires, flipped on the switch and nothing happened. So he decided to unplug it, go back through it again, read the manual, recheck the connections, fastened the wires more securely, and again flipped it on, and nothing happened. And he's starting to get frustrated, and his daughter walks into the room and says, wow, what a cool computer. Dad, can I plug it in? <laughs> it 
Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's, it's in the, the fact that we're not plugged in. We're not connected. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not finding our, our sustenance, our juice, our, our, our support, our lifeline in that space. The Old Testament and New Testament confirm this idea. First Chronicles 6, 11, seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. It's living in that space of connection. And it's easy to get disconnected in the world. So many things. Um, you don't even need to get outside of this building to get disconnected. Probably you might be already disconnected because you're like, kind of like, okay, Donovan, enough. Uh, <laughs> but connected to God and connected deeply, deeply. And the same Matthew puts it in, in these words in chapter 21. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Of course. Um, but, but the second thing, I think, apart from the connection that it invites us into, is a submission. It invites us into a submission to God's control. Connection is one thing, but sometimes just being subject to. I find being subject, submitting, is not an easy thing for me. Anybody here finds it easy to submit? I was in a little space yesterday, actually, where... Um, so, so, some of us were invited, or let me put it the, the, the real way, were, were, were fooled into, into, into attending a little gathering. So, 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 so others might have been invited, but some of us were deliberately not told what it was and, and brought to a space. It was all of the, um, uh, um, the, the ministers in the United Church, the, the, um, the pastors serving, and some person in the church decided to do it um, from one of the churches and invited us into a space. It was a lovely space up in Northside and just invited us to that space. And when we got there, they said, okay, you're here because we think you just need a few moments to disconnect and to, and to connect with God. I'm like, really? And I thought of a hundred other things that I could be doing with this time now. And, 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 and thought about, you know, I don't mind having retreats and having times away, but I need to know what I'm getting into, and I need to be the one to. And it took me a moment or two, and interestingly, when the rest of us got together and started to talk, the same experience all of us had was like, um, let, let me come to this because I have chosen to come to this, you know, kind of a thing. Sometimes submitting is a hard thing. I think it's a hard thing for human beings to do. We don't like to be led, especially led blindly into anything. But, but here is the space where we're invited, for we're oftentimes living our lives by our own directives, by our own instructions. So we might also be living our lives reacting to the stuff that is happening around us. So we, we direct ourselves, we organize, we figure out where we're going. It's, it's our rules. Or we simply are reacting, reacting to what's happening around us. Or we live our lives in search of the things that the world defines as worthy of our pursuit. And oftentimes as believers, as Christians, we do not live in submission to God. Because we do not have our eyes on the prize. Remember when Peter was walking on water in, um, in the same chapter, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. He saw Jesus on the water and he says to Jesus, If it is you, tell me to come out to the water. And Jesus says, come. And he gets out of the boat and he starts to walk on the water towards Jesus. And then the verse ends up saying, But when he saw the wind, what happened? He was afraid. And he started to sink. Peter had the power to walk on the water as long as his gaze and his walk were centered on Christ, were in submission to what God in Christ is inviting him to do. Come, come, come towards me. But when he became distracted by, by what else was around him, that focus was shifted. In the Old Testament, Samson had the same problem. Remember him? He was a guy who had a real connection to God because he was given this promise. And while he submitted himself to God, 
And symbolically, didn't cut his hair as a dependence on God. This is the one sign that he was going to submit to what God said. Of course, after he allowed himself to kind of be inveigled and he violated what his agreement with God was, he lost his abilities. Sometimes that's where we are. I found something else from another Christian writer that says, like the eagle that sat down on the frozen ground to feed on its prey, when it was ready to fly, it found its wings were so frozen to the ice that it could never rise again. It perished beside its costly pleasure. Or like the ship that sailed so close to the current that it was not possible to stem the tide that drove it over the abyss. So too, the lackadaisical Christian who flirts with the world, who finds him or herself having neither heart nor strength to rise to our heavenly calling. When we move ourselves from under the control, the direction of our God. Colossians 3, 1, and 1 to 3 says it this way. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above when, where Christ is. He's seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So there's no other way to describe faith but radical. Even mustard seed faith is always radical faith because it is extreme, it is militar militant, it is revolutionary. It's about putting your entire self into the powerful and loving hands of God. That's what faith is. A bishop from the Church of England ran out of petrol one day when he and his wife were driving down the road. And he re she remembered seeing a gas station about half a mile um, behind them, so she told him, yeah, maybe you better walk up there and get some. So he goes to the back of his car, trying to find a container to go buy the gas in, eh, petrol, and so he all he finds is his grandson's potty that was left in the, in the back of his, his car. So that would have to do. So he trudged a half a mile up the road, and he got the gas in that, and he gingerly walked back to his car carefully, um, you know, guarding the contents so it wouldn't spill. And he comes and is ready to pour it into his gas tank. Just then, the leader of one of the new churches in town, one of the guys who had left the mainline church and gone independent, recognized that a fellow Christian was in need. So he stopped, uh, wanting to offer a hand. And as he approached, he saw the bishop pouring something out of the potty into the car. And he gasped. If I had known they had faith like that in the Church of England, I would never have left. Faith like that. If you have faith as a mustard seed, a reliance, a trust in God, wholeheartedly submitting to God, that is where we find reconciliation with God. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we are thankful. Thankful that you come to us in the spaces of our lives that are, are challenging, where there is difficulty. That having met us on the mountain, in the spaces where we find joy and and celebrating your goodness, you walk with us into the valleys. We thank you for being with us today in this place and for the promise to go with us into the world. We are especially thankful for the gift of peace that comes from knowing Christ, that peace which offers us reconciliation in our relationships, that peace that energizes and gives us courage to share our lives with others. That peace that transforms the ministries that we do in your church. Lord, we lift up your world, broken. You are the God over all the nations. 
And so we pray that you will come near to those places and people who are the victims of war, of natural disasters, people who are hungry and without homes, people who are in deep mourning over loss. We pray for people who are in the far-flung regions of the world and those who are right on our doorsteps. Break down all walls of hostility. Purge from us old suspicions and remove from us any spirit of revenge. Lift us up to, to be your people, the people who are connected to you, God of compassion, the people who submit to you, God of healing. And so now we pray that you will remember those ones that we love, for whom we are concerned, as we in silence call their names to you. Thank you for the gift of this meal that we now will share together as a reminder of that sacrifice and love. And cause that as we eat and drink and commune, we will become your people in the world, bringing the gospel to all. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. I'm stubbornly determined for us to learn this new song. Um, it's a modern day song, so it's going to be on the overhead. That's going to be our communion hymn. We sang it the last time, so um, hopefully we might remember the tune, and I hope that if we continue practicing in this way, we'll eventually learn it. If you have not received a communion element, just put your hand up and one will be given.
as we share in the bread and, and, and cup, I invite you to share in the words that are projected, the ones bold and italicized are yours. This is the Lord's table. The Lord Jesus himself invites us to share this joyful feast. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And thanks and praise to God, whose love for us is mirrored in the lives of all who have struggled to live faithfully as an expression of our love for God and all our sisters and brothers, and in remembrance of all the meals Jesus shared with saints and sinners we come now to feast in joy and harmony, humbly with God. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and whose load is heavy, and I will give you rest. I am the bread of life. I will never turn away anyone who comes to me. The Lord Jesus, in the night that he was betrayed, took bread and wine, and he gave thanks for them, and he blessed them. Let us draw near to God and offer God our thanksgiving. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise to God. Gracious God, we praise you for your mercies, for your goodness that creates us, your grace that sustains us, your power that strengthens us, your patience which bears with us, and your love which has redeemed us. We thank you that you came to heal this broken world, that you died for us and rose triumphant from the dead. Because you live, we live to praise you, our God forever. Therefore, with your people of all places and times, and with all of you, claim your greatness. Amen. So, as it, it is as we gather in praise and thanksgiving at this time, we remember how on the night that he was betrayed before his passion, he broke bread and gave thanks, saying, Take and eat of this. This is my body, which will be broken for you. And we recall as well how, in the same way, when the meal was over, he took the cup and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my blood, which will be shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. Lord, as we have been commanded, and remembering the death and resurrection of your Son, we offer you this bread and this cup, thankful that you have counted us worthy to serve you. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of this world. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of this world. Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of this world. Given God, we invite you now to send down your Holy Spirit to bless us in these gifts, gifts of bread and wine, that the bread which we break may be for us a communion in the body of Christ the cup of blessing which we bless, the communion of the blood of Christ. And in receiving them by faith, may we be able to be made partakers of his body and blood with all of his benefits to nourish us and to help us grow in grace to the glory of your most holy name. Gracious God, here now we offer and present to you our very selves to be a living sacrifice dedicated and fit for your acceptance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Draw near with faith, receive the body and blood of Christ, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. For we who are many are one body, for we all share the one bread. We share the cup of salvation. Sisters and brothers, as you have received of the elements, 
and they have been blessed, invite you to partake the body of Christ given for you. cup of God's salvation. Drink and be thankful. We give you thanks, gracious God, for your gift of this meal, of this body, of this salvation, of belonging. And we pray that you might ever use us as we remain connected and as we submit to your control and giving God we pray that you'll accept our offerings that we present to you today in the sanctuary as well as by direct deposit we ask you to help us to be diligent stewards to grant our leaders wisdom in the use of these gifts so that the gospel might be proclaimed and those who are in need might be supported hear us loving God and let our cries come to you because of Jesus. Amen. We have a special time in our service today. We're going to have children's time now. One, two, and three, our four. children have been, for the beginning of the year until now, learning about creation. So they're going to come and do a short presentation for us and tell us about what they've learned. Um, we'll have a, a song while they're making their way down. Five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. On day number one, God made light. He made the day and he made the night. On day number two, God made the sky. It's big and blue and way up high. Ooh. Whoa. On day number three, God made the sea. He made the land, every plant and tree. On day number four, God made the stars. He put the sun in the sky, super duper far. Whoa. Whoa. God made you and God made me. He made On day number five, God made birds and fish Dolphins and whales and things that go squish On day number six, God made animals and bugs Foxes and cubs, all for us to hug Whoa, whoa On day number six, God also made man He said it was good and part of his plan On day number seven, God stopped to rest a loud voice I don't usually use a microphone and um, with the little ones we covered all the, the material last week so what I'm going to do today is just show you some of the different ways we try to get the information to stay put we have a lovely poster in the classroom that was brought by Terry Mason a long time ago which is actually the words of Genesis 1 verse 1 a lovely one and the kids have in the early days spent time organizing the words written on cards into the correct order. We also have done the memory game, where we have two of everything, you have to find the match. That was the easy part. The harder version of that was when you had to match the correct day number with what was created on the day. So not only did they have to recognize what was being turned up, but they had to know what it went with. I've got Megan here. 
we spent a day when we were looking at all the different sea creatures. Megan, you hold on to them, and I'm going to show people that we had different ones. Hold tight. That, oh, Madison, sorry. Hold tight. That's it. So we did the kelp forests. We did the ice, and then we did the warm waters just to see how many fish we had. Well done. And then Angus and Tilly spent a day doing a very complicated jigsaw. Can you tell what it is? It's sitting in water. That was only just to hold it together. Yes, a giraffe. And we had another one done another day, which he helped with, which was putting a fish together. And then today, we completed a lovely collage on the wall of the classroom, where we added each element, and the kids chose what animals to stick on, and put the sun in the sky and the moon. And then we played a game, and Ben's got, we had a bag of stones, and each stone has a T on one side and an F on the other side. So with each statement I made, they had to decide which side of the stone they were going to show on the table. Was what I said true, or was what I said false? And we managed to get through that. Given that some of them haven't been there for every week, we actually did it very well. Those are some of the things we've been doing. We are a little bit cramped for space. I would love to have taken them out in a scavenger hunt, but it's not practical. But just to give you some idea as to what goes on upstairs. So in the older class, we have also been looking at God's creation. And this, what you see on screen there, is what we've been focusing on. So we looked at Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And we discovered four very important things about God by reading those two chapters. And we're going to tell you about them now. Okay. Close your eyes. Try to imagine what it was like before creation. It's impossible, right? Now keep your eyes closed and think about just one of your favorite things of God's creations. Maybe it's a carpet, a carpet of stars in the night sky, or a beautiful sunset, or a delicate flower, or a coral reef teeming with life, or maybe your family. You can open your eyes now. You could keep going forever, thinking about individual bits of amazing that God's created out of nothing. When we thought about all this, we realized how incredible God's creation, creative power was. He simply spoke, and, and worlds appeared from nothing. As we, as we study Genesis, we realize there is nothing haphazard about the way God created the world. He ordered his creation in a way that each step laid the foundations that made the next step possible. Imagine a world without fish, but no seas, rivers, or lakes. Animals, but no plant for them to eat. Plants, but no water, carbon dioxide, or soil to sustain them. Clouds, but no sky for them to sit in. That would make no sense. It would be a disaster. As we looked at God's careful, orderly creation process, we would, could see that he also created the world with wisdom. So, once God had created the right environment for life, he created a great variety of creatures. We took on the challenge of creating our own brand new animals, complete with name, habitat, interesting features, and most importantly, we had to design them with a special purpose. And this was the best we could come up with. <laughs> well, we had a few of them. <laughs> but that was a fun class. That was very much enjoyed. When we thought about the different creatures that God created, we could see that each of them, from the huge whale to the tiny hummingbird, was made with a special purpose. Think about bees. About one third of the world's food depends on these little guys with their super pollination powers as they buzz from plant to plant. And what about cats, a favorite of mine? We've used them for thousands of years to kill rats so they can't spread diseases that would kill us. So each part of God's creation has a special purpose, and that includes us. God created people for many reasons, but in Genesis 1 and 2, we saw that he gave people one special purpose specifically related to his creation, to take care of the things that he made. We thought about how we can praise God for his wonderful creation by doing our best to look after it. On this poster I've just made this morning, we have pictures of caring for our environment. It's not just something we learn about in school and it's a good thing to do, but it's a reflection of our love of God and what he has done for us. 
With perfect timing, we made our final discovery about the God who created us. At the start of the week of Valentine's Day, God created us with love. But God's love is not the bunches of flowers and love heart cards of Valentine's Day. He shows us his love through a deep care and concern for our needs. He cared for Adam by giving him a wonderful place to live, providing him with all his needs, and creating a special companion for him. He loves us so much, he created us in his image so that we have character traits like him. This gives us a special place in creation above the animals and allows us to have a special relationship with him. And even though God knew that we would turn away from him, he, he loved us so much that he had a plan from the beginning to bring us back to him through his son, Jesus. And that is what we're going to be learning about next. And that's it. Thank you, Ms. Nadine, Ms. Valerie, for all the time and effort that you put into Sunday School, and for all the brave children sitting in front that participated today. You made my job very easy because I just had to announce children's time rather than having to do a children's time. I invite us to stand now as we sing our going forth hymn, Come Let Us Sing of a Wonderful Love. I just worked out that I know that to sing this to a different tune, so I'm not sure which one you know. Brad's going to play both. <laughs> oh, you're going to play one. <laughs> just making sure you're paying attention. <laughs> And now may the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us today and every day.